Thank you, Evan. Um, our last final presenter this morning is Athman Shah. He's a first-year neurosurgery resident, and he'll tell us about neuro-ophthalmological complications of neoplastic leptomeningeal disease. So, uh, thanks for having me. I just completed my month on uh, the service, and I, so this will, this presentation will be about leptomeningeal carcinomatosis. Our story start, starts off with patient SK. So uh, this is a patient I saw with Anastasia as well as Dr. Warner. Uh, this is a 30-year-old female with this new complaint of bilateral vision loss. Um, she was rather somnolent, so all the information that was taken during the uh, exam and uh, that was taken from the mother. So she has a history of ER negative, PR negative, HER2 new breast cancer. Her last uh, cycle of chemotherapy was in December of 2015. Um, so in September 2016, she developed these severe headaches and a change in behavior, including excessive profanity. So uh, from a neurosurgical perspective, anytime you see change in behavior that dramatic, uh, you think something in the frontal lobe. So uh, the MRI brain confirmed this, demonstrated a right frontal lobe metastasis. In September 23rd, that lesion was resected with Dr. Jensen here at the U. And then on October 8th, she endorsed visual changes and headache. And the MRI demonstrated new cerebellar lesion and uh, leptomeningeal enhancement. Just to complete the picture, past medical history, depression, diabetes, and of course, uh, breast cancer. Uh, family history, she had an extensive family history of cancer in her family, uh, colon and breast cancer. Uh, and medication, she's on Decadron for inflammation and swelling, Keppra for seizure prophylaxis, and oxycodone for pain. So on physical exam, her visual acuity, she was only able to see hand motion. Uh, and there was no nystagmus. Pupils were equally round and reactive, no afferent pupillary defect, interocular pressure, pressures are listed, uh, anterior and uh, external and anterior segments were normal. The other salient finding was uh, on dilated fundus exam, we, we saw optic nerve swelling um, with uh, several uh, fl flame hemorrhages. So to look at some of the imaging, just to orient you guys, this is an axial T1 post contrast image. Um, So right here we see this is the fourth ventricle, uh, cerebellum. This is uh, the CPA or the cerebellar pontine angle. These are the internal auditory canals. Uh, the nose is up here, eyes are here. Um, and so what we see first and foremost is the enhancement of the internal auditory canal, uh, which is uh, indicative of leptomeningeal uh, carcinomatosis. Uh, we also see this pretty big goomba here on the right cere cerebellar hemisphere. Uh, and which is um, basically an additional uh, MET uh, from her breast cancer. Uh, and a lumbar puncture was performed and uh, cytology was positive for malignant cells. So a little, little bit of background, what is leptomeningeal disease? Well, to understand that first, we have to understand what's on the surface of the brain. So we have the pia mater, the arachnoid, and then the, then the dura mater. So leptomeningeal disease is when, or basically when neoplastic cells disseminate through, through the cerebrospinal fluid. And so it involves a P in the arachnoid mater. Sorry, the P in the arachnoid membranes. So uh, as far as breast cancer goes, uh, any breast cancers that are ER negative and PR negative tend to have a higher risk for developing uh, LD. Um, other cancers, melanoma, lung, gastrointestinal tumors also ha can have a proclivity for developing leptomeningeal disease. Um, and the overall incidence is dependent on the primary tumor, but on average ranges 3 to 5% of patients with systemic cancer. As far as diag uh, diagnostics, uh, CSF is the gold standard. Um, next also would be neuroimaging. And lastly, I'll present some, some more novel approaches to diagnosing. But it, uh, ideally, you would want to get about 10.5 cc's of uh, fluid. Um, Oftentimes, if the initial lumbar punctures are negative, but there's a high suspicion, uh, you should repeat it. Uh, and uh, some of the findings you would find are nonspecific pleocytosis, hyperproteinemia, and an elevated opening pressure. Uh, there are uh, false positives known to occur with uh, traumatic taps. And the CSF cytology has pretty good specificity, but the sensitivity is only 50%. And even on some patients, 10% of patients will have uh, negative findings, uh, in, in, even with repeated lumbar punctures. 
For diagnostics, T1, uh, post, uh, T1 with contrast is the ideal imaging modality. Uh, the sensitivity range is about, 50, about 60 to 70 percent, and specificity is around 77. I thought this would be kind of neat to add. Uh, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. Oh, great. So, so basically, NIAC uh, has published on this rare cell capture technology. They essentially use antibodies covered with ferrous particles to um, identify some of these glycoproteins found on the surface of uh, carcinomas. And so the one they look at mainly is EPCAM. And uh, so there were only an N of 15 in the study they published, so there's a lot more work that needs to be done. But in the 15, the sensitivity was about 100%. Uh, other things, CSF biomarkers, uh, such as VEGF and anti-tissue type plasminogen activator, also have uh, pretty high sensitivity and specificity compared to current uh, methods of diagnos diagnosis. So uh, why does this relate to ophthalmology? Well, uh, if you look at the most frequent signs and symptoms, Headaches, double vision, and back pain are the most frequent symptoms. Most frequent signs are altered mental status, uh, ocular motor paresis, and leg weakness. But uh, double vision and ocular motor paresis are two of the most common, uh, uh, most common symptoms and signs. So the ophthalmology exam is incredibly important as, if, the, if, any, if there is high suspicion. Um, the most common cranial nerve symptom is diplopia. Visual loss is reported in roughly 3 to 10 percent of patients. Um, and loss of acuity is roughly in around uh, 2 to 20 percent of patients. So to talk about the pathophysiology, why do patients with uh, leptomeningeal disease, um, why do they develop visual loss? Well, there's um, two papers. This, I don't believe this, this person is not the same Dr. Katz that works in the department. Uh, but uh, Katz et al., uh, they did uh, some pathology reports on patients um, who had leptomeningeal disease. And they found that uh, the, these cancer cells can invade uh, these Virchow-Robinson spaces um, in the pair of va vascular areas around the optic nerve. And they lead to demyelination and axonal degeneration. Uh, so McFadzian et al. sort of corroborated this, but then one step, went one step further and did xenon studies to look at cerebral blood flow. And they found that 88% uh, of patients with leptomeningeal disease tend to have uh, reduced uh, cerebral blood flow. So the model they put forth is that ischemia and impaired metabolism probably contribute somewhat to the visual loss. To talk a little bit about prognosis, it has a very poor prognosis, unfortunately. Untreated patients die usually within one to nine weeks. Um, and so uh, basically early diagnosis is essential. And so um, patients who present with fewer neurological deficits generally have improved survival. A couple conclusions that can be drawn is that, uh, just from the presentations, breast cancers that ha have negative ER and PR receptors are considered to be at higher risk for developing leptomeningeal disease. Uh, diagnosis through CSF and neuroimaging findings are the main ways we go about it now. However, there are other ways that show promise. Visual loss likely occurs to demyelination and, and axonal degeneration. And, um, the uh, neuro -optho exam is incredibly important as these can be some of the initial presenting symptoms. And just to wrap up the story, just to tell you a little, little bit about what's going on with her right now, she had an Omaya reservoir placed by, placed by Dr. Jensen. She's had intrathecal trest, uh, trastuzumab and methotrexate starting in uh, the middle of October. She unfortunately was intubated for respiratory distress. Uh, she has recovered somewhat and uh, she has received trastuzumab and uh, pertuzumab on the 15th, x-ray therapy to the mediastinum, and um, she started her second cycle in the beginning of no November, and she still continues to fight the, the disease. What's happening with her vision? Her vision, I, I don't believe so. So you say increased survival. If non-treated, one to nine weeks, how much better is treated? Right. I, it, it only, um, I believe it's up to 20 weeks at this point, but um, I would have to go back and I remember reading it, but I don't think I can say for sure.
is if there's something that can be done or might be done, then they'll know about it. Thank you, Dr. Shah. Does anybody else have any questions? That's a good question, Dr. Ward. It's just like any other. It could be single or multiple. Uh, I think that one of the things that's surprising is often how few deficits the patient may have based on how bad their CNS situation is. Uh, but it can it can be one or multiple. I don't think that it being only one is reassuring. Thanks very much.